Okay, so here's the kind of thing we're gonna we're gonna do today. We're gonna we're gonna look at answering a question like this: Gas is being forced into a spherical balloon at a rate of 400 cubic feet per minute, and just reminding us, you know, there's volume of a sphere and there's surface area of a sphere. At what rate is the radius growing when the radius is 10 feet? Okay. So what we're talking about here is something dynamic. We're not just talking about something static. If we want to look at, for example, a graph of if we want to look at a graph of just v equals four thirds pi r cubed. So here's the r axis and here's the v axis. It's not surprising, right? You get something like that. It makes sense. If, if when r uh, when r is equal to two the value of the volume is 32 pi over 3. You know, it's easy to calculate. We're just evaluating a function, right? It's a nonlinear function, though, right? Can anybody just, without being too fancy, can you articulate why it is that the slope is increasing of this graph? Well, what are the ramifications of that fact? It seems pretty simple. But what's that tell us? I mean, what's important about that? If I double the volume, am I, if I double the radius, am I doubling the volume? I'm not even close, right? If I double the radius, like if I go back to A equals 1, when the radius is 1, well, the volume is 4 thirds pi, right? When the radius is 2, the volume is 32 thirds pi. What did I multiply by? 1. 4. Okay. Uh, no. Multiply by 8. Right, I multiplied by, if I double it, I end up multiplying by 2 cubed, which is 8. Right? See how that works? I mean, it makes sense. You don't really need calculus to see that part of it, right? Uh, but this is, this is why, and this is kind of what we'll indirectly get at today. I want to explain a phenomenon that I care if we ever talked about this before. This one works pretty well. We talk about the blowing up the balloon phenomenon. Okay. So we've all experienced this at a birthday party. At some point in your life, you've blown up some balloons. Right? Blowing up balloons, if you want to look at kind of your satisfaction, here's another psychological experiment that could do. The satisfaction you feel of blowing up a balloon starts off really high, and it gets really low after a while. Because as you're blowing the thing up, your first puff it just, it just expands really fast, and that's really satisfying. You just did something. You can tangibly, your progress is pretty large for that first breath. But after about 40 breaths, 40. So what is it going to be a big balloon? After about 40 breaths or 20 breaths or whatever, at that point, for each little, you, you push the same amount of volume into the balloon, but you don't notice much of a tangible result. I mean, you can all relate to that, right? After a while, it's like, well, this thing, is it even getting any bigger? Okay? And we can explain that, right? I mean, you could probably almost hint at it a little bit now, but that's where calculus comes in. Calculus is dynamic. We can look at not just... Uh, volume as a function of radius, we can look at the rate at which volume is changing as we, as we increase radius, or vice versa, right? As we add volume to a balloon, we could explore the rate at which the radius of the balloon is increasing. It's not going to be linear. It's going to be a lot bigger when the radius is small than when it's large, right? Okay, so how do we go about doing something like this then? How do we answer a question like this? I'm going to give you just a little, for now, let's just, we're going to follow a little recipe. And, and we'll kind of reverse engineer this and see if we can figure out, okay, why does this make so much sense? So you can see already here that if gas is being forced into a spherical balloon, the volume of the balloon is changing, right? So you can't look at this like every other math problem you've ever done could be essentially described by a static picture. 
things like the, the kinds of problems that you would have had previous to this and everything up through Algebra 2, maybe even pre-calculus, would have been things like, okay, if the volume of a balloon is whatever our last example was, 64 pi over 3 or something like that, uh, what's, what's the radius? Right? And we could find out by just you know, solving for r, by doing some little bit of algebra, right? So I'll be isolating r and figuring out what the value of r is for that value of v. But the picture hasn't changed. The picture of the balloon has stayed the same the whole time. The picture is changing here. A picture no longer suffices. We have to now think about this in terms of a video, right? Where each frame in the picture, each frame in the video corresponds to a moment in time. So if we were to force gas into a balloon, the balloon is going to increase in volume and radius, right? So we've got, we want to know at, at the instant when the radius is 10 feet, at what rate is the radius growing? So we've got to isolate, out of the infinite frames in that movie, we've got to isolate the one frame that corresponds to that event, right? But, but there, there are an infinite number of different pictures that we're actually taking into account because this is a dynamic process, right? So the first step is, when we're doing related rates types problems. And that's really what this is. If you think about what we're doing here, we're trying to relate rates of change. Rates of change are derivatives to us, right? That's what calculus, or that's what uh, differential calculus does. When we differentiate something, we're finding rates of change. We started off with just rates of change of y with respect to x, but we ended up doing some other things too, right? We've actually done some examples where we've calculated rates of change with respect to t, for example, right? Uh, so in this case, we want to know at what rate is the radius growing, right? How fast is the radius growing with time when gas is being forced into a balloon at a rate of 400 cubic feet per minute, okay? So the first step is let's identify what we might call all of the snapshot variables. That's what I call it. Meaning at that one frame in the movie when the radius of the balloon is 10 feet, what are the values of all of the variables and the rates at that one frame in the video. Okay, so what do we know? Step one, identify snapshot variables. What are some things that we know there? Okay, so we know the radius is 10. There's one thing that we know. So we can, at step one, the snapshot variables, I'm just gonna call it snapshot. We know that R equals 10. You know, technically, we, we're not going to mess around with the units. We'll just assume that we're measuring distance in what here? Lengths are being measured in what units? Feet. Feet. Time is being measured in? Okay, so we'll just be consistent. You know, we can just suppress the units as we say in physics, right? So R equals 10. What else do we know? Okay, so now let's, let's try to say that in a calculus way. The rate of change of volume that's what that is. If gas is being forced into a balloon at that rate, how do we know that that's a rate of change of volume? Maybe a little bit of it's contextual, right? Because we know that gas has volume and it's being pushed into the balloon, but there's a much more obvious way to recognize that that's a rate of change of volume. Cubic feet. Cubic feet. Look at the units, right? The units are in cubic feet per minute, right? So the rate on top is cubic feet. The rate on bottom is, is a minute, so that's time. So what, uh, what derivative is that representing? V prime. Meaning, let me be more specific. V prime meaning D, no, D V, D what? No? D R. D T. D T, right? Because it's units of, of distance over units of time, right? Or units of volume, sorry, units of volume over units of time, sorry, right? So that's got to be dv dt, right? dv dt equals positive 400, okay? So what are some ways of saying dv dt? Well, we would have called that maybe v prime to make it easier, right? Now, when we look at actual related rates problems, does it make sense that, what do you suppose that the independent variable is almost always gonna be in every case here? What's the variable that's gonna, that we're gonna use to track the change in a system? I know. Time, right? 
So the rate is almost always going to be a rate of change with respect to time, right? We're interested, and doesn't that make sense within the context of our video analogy, right? You think about that little, you know, especially in the old DCRs, now it's had that little time counter along the bottom, right? And so that's what's marking the moment in time of each frame, right? But a system is really only interesting when it evolves in time, and that's what we study in, in physics and in, other, in economics and all these other sciences that rely on calculus, right? Calculus is really a tool to help us understand all this, this evolution of these, of these systems that are interesting to us as thinking humans, right? And so T is almost always going to be the variable we're differentiating with respect to now. No longer X so much, right? X was just a kind of an academic uh, variable that we could use because of the XY plane. It's easy to make graphs in the XY plane. But in real life, we want to know how things are changing with time. Because time is such a common independent variable for us in applications of calculus, instead of calling this V prime of T, something like that, we really don't do that. We just call it V dot. Now, not everybody does that. There are a lot of calculus books that, that don't do that, but my background's in physics, and so I want to go about this from a physics perspective, because most people don't become theoretical mathematicians, they become doctors or biologists or engineers or right or physicists or something like that. And so this is something you're likely to see. So this dot notation, when you put a dot over a variable, what that's telling you specifically is that's the that's like a prime but with a T. It's, it's we're differentiating with respect to T. Okay? So we could say then that V dot is equal to positive four hundred. Okay, and that's just D V D T. That's all that means, that dot remember. Okay, anything else we're being given here? So we are given a relationship in terms of an equation, but they're not giving us any other values, are they? Any other snapshot values? Those are the things that we're told specifically about that one frame in the movie. But the other thing that's interesting here, or that's important to us, is what are we being asked to find? We're being asked to find dr dt. Now, how would we say that using our new notation? R dot. R dot, right? So here's the other part that we're looking for, and that is at what rate is the radius growing, right? So we're looking for R dot. Okay, so there is our list of snapshot variables. Now, as you do these problems, you're going to find that sometimes you'll go back and revise that list. There may be instances where you want to go back and some other information that's given to you allows you to make a calculation and say, oh, okay, well, actually, we can determine another value of a variable at that moment in time, and we can add it to the list, you know, for our consumption in solving the problem, right? You don't need to here, though. So step one, we've got everything. This describes that frame in the movie, the snapshot in the movie. Step two is we want to come up with what's called a parent equation. So now we want to come up with the... Uh, with the non-dynamic equation. We just want to come up with an equation that relates everything in here, right, the, the rates that are being compared. So we're trying to compare the rate of change of radius to the rate of change of volume. So you can think about this as almost kind of blurring your calculus vision and ignoring the dots. If I ignore all the dots, what are the static quantities that we're comparing with? Volume and radius, right? So we're just we're comparing volume and radius, aren't we? Now, with calculus, we can look at the rates of change of those, but the static parent equation uh, that relates, you know, if we don't consider anything changing in time, if we're just looking at, you know, kind of a more pre-calculus approach to this, the static uh, quantities that are being compared are volume and radius. And so step two, our parent equation, is already given to us. What is our parent equation? V equals four thirds pi r cubed, right? So our parent equation is V equals four thirds pi r cubed, exactly. Now to calculusify this, what we've got to do is we've got to we've got to differentiate this implicitly to introduce the rates. Okay? Sometimes you'll notice here that our goal is, if you read through the guidelines here, go ahead and take a look at these, that little half sheet I give you, and I'll give you a full sheet with the, today's example included on there. Okay? Uh, 
Step two is create a parent equation involving all variables included in the snapshot values and all variables whose rates are included in the snapshot values. Whenever possible, the parent equation should end up as a function of a single independent variable. Okay? So there will be times that we're going to have to maybe go back and do some tweaking to get this down in terms of a single, uh, of a single variable. Okay? We'll look at, not probably today, but my, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through some introductory examples today, and then every day I'll just add an example that just kind of further extends our understanding of this process. But this is a big problem. This is like one of the most, if you get this, you will. But when you get this, this encompasses everything we've learned. This is a big ticket item to calculus, is understanding related rates. Okay, so then next step is going to be we got our parent equation. Now we're going to introduce calculus by just differentiating implicitly with respect to what? T. T. Because, how come T? Because of this, right? We know that we're looking at rates of change with respect to time, and we almost always will in these problems. So our goal in step three is, we could call the step if we wanted to, this is the step where we relate the rates. This is the verb in our calculus sentence here. When we relate the rates, we start with the parent equation and we just implicitly differentiate. So what's that going to give us? If I implicitly differentiate the left side of the equation with respect to t, what do I get? We would have called it v prime or v dt, but now it's v dot. Good. So v dot equals, here I've got this 4 3rd pi that's a constant, right? What's the derivative with respect to t, and we have to use the chain rule, don't we, of r cubed? 4 thirds pi r and 3 pi, uh, 3 r squared r dot. Good. We need, so there's two layers to this, aren't there, because we're differentiating with respect to t. The derivative of hand cubed is 3 hand squared, but then the derivative of hand, hand is r. The derivative of r is r dot. Okay, so now we've we've calculusified this, right? We've you know we've introduced the rates. The last step is just plug and chug. We're just going to figure out what is it that we're trying to find. Let's algebraically isolate that part of the equation and then just plug and chug, right? We can simplify things a little bit, can't we? We've got these threes are canceling, right? So uh, if I wanted, I'm trying to solve for trying to solve for r dot. So what would I end up with if I solve for r dot? V dot over 4 pi r squared. So we get r dot equals, I've got my v dot, I'm going to divide by 4 pi r squared. That's it, right? The only thing left on the top is just the v dot. And if I plug in the values for my snapshot variables, what do I get? Uh, 400 divided by 4 times pi times 10 squared. So just 1 over pi. When all the dust settles, everybody agree? Okay, let's go ahead and include the, the units on this one, though. What are my units going to be? What should r dot be in? No. no radius. Feet per minute. Because r, think what r dot is. It's the rate of change of radius with respect to time. So I should have units. Radius would be measured in units of feet in this case. And time is being measured in minutes. So we get 1, one over pi feet per minute. Let's discuss that answer for a second. What does that even mean? Right? The rate of change of the radius when the radius is 10 feet is 1 over pi feet per minute. Now, I know we've had some discussions like this. Does that mean that in the next minute, the, the radius is going to increase by exactly 1 over pi? At that instant, that's the rate at which it's changing. It's, we could, we could 
A good analogy is a speedometer in a car. Right? If we're accelerating, put my foot on the gas and I'm accelerating, if I take one, let's say I'm accelerating from zero to 60, somewhere along that I go through 25 miles an hour. At the moment I'm going 25 miles an hour, is that predictive of how fast or how far I'm going to go between now and the next second? No, because my speed's always changing. But at that one instant, it tells me how fast is the road flying by. Right? It's giving me an instantaneous speed, which is all that is, is just the instantaneous rate of change of position. Right? It's my instantaneous velocity. Right? Actually, it doesn't mean velocity's got a direction, but you get the idea. Do you see what I'm trying to get at here? I mean, physics people see the limitations in that analogy probably a little bit, but, but you get the idea, right? This is just telling us at that moment, kind of visually, how fast would the radius be changing? Well, that's a number I can attach to it. If I evaluate this at a different point in the inflation process, I'm going to get back a different number. And there are going to be real ramifications of those numbers. If the number is bigger, that's going to be a more satisfying part of the blowing up the balloon because it's the, the radius is changing more quickly. Right? We can kind of see this a little bit if we look at, if we go back and look at this, this guy right here. So if I add... One nice thing about Desmos, and this is going to college, this is good to know. I can define, if I define V of R as 4 thirds pi R cubed, well, I could define a new function, call it F of R, as V prime of R. Desmos knows that means I'm differentiating, right? So there's the derivative function. And, and we can make that connection. It's probably good, good for us to periodically do this, right? Let's just make sure that all this stuff makes sense. Right? Doesn't that make sense here that, that the, the blue function, which is the derivative function, needs to have a value of zero where the slope is zero, right? As an ant walks along the red function, what seems to be happening? Well, his slope is increasing, 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 and so the value of the blue function is getting taller, 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 right? Going back to the left, as the ant walks along this function, well, his slope is really large and positive. Now it's decreasing towards zero, though. Right? The tangent lines are getting less steep and less steep and less steep. And so the value of the derivative is starting big and getting smaller. Well, that matches the behavior of the blue derivative function. Does that ring a bell? Remember talking about that stuff. Right? Okay, so we could do something like this then. Let's go ahead and I've just I've just defined a function that corresponds to the tangent line for any value of a that we choose. Well, what do you notice there? That tangent line is clearly getting steeper. And so the value of the derivative function is increasing. Okay. Is that, can you make that correlation to the stuff we're talking about there then? Right? The fact that, that whatever the slope of that line is, that tangent line, that's corresponding to the value that we're getting back. Actually, that's not true. That's not true. There, there's another, it's, it's not quite that simple. The, there's going to be a time associated with with each one of these points on here, right? Each one of these points on this red graph corresponds to one snapshot in our video. And we have to just figure out, well, which is the snapshot that goes with which point in time? This process sorts all that out for us. It's really amazing that it can do it so easily. Calculus is a fabulous tool. I mean, it does so much so easily. You appreciate that more and more when you start to use it. Let's try another one. About something like that. Okay. This is just a more mathematical example. We're just talking about distance in the xy plane. Okay, but we've got this function, y equals x squared plus 1. We know what that looks like. It's just a parabola that's what have I done to my basic parent graph? Shifted it up one. Good. So we want to know find the rate of change of the distance between the origin. That's interesting spelling of origin there between the origin and a moving point on the graph of this curve, okay? If the rate of change of x with respect to time is 2 centimeters per second. Okay, so we know that, that the, the, the rate at which x is increasing is a constant 2 meters per second. Why? We don't know anything about y, though, okay? Let's try this, okay? So let, let's apply our four-step process to, to you know, this related rates process. What's the first thing? Snapshot variables. Okay, good. Snapshot variables. 
and, and if we want just a little picture to orient ourselves, that's understandable. Right? Here's our there's our parabola. Here's some point with coordinates x, y, and we're really just interested in that distance. Right? Let's call that distance s. And that's the quantity that we're measuring. How fast is, is the distance increasing as this particle moves along this function so that the x dt is always 2? Can you tell me something about that particle's motion, though? Like down here at the very bottom, where it's moving horizontally, its inst instantaneous speed would be 2, right? Because there is no y motion. But as I move further along the function up here, what's going to have to happen to the overall speed at which that bead is sliding along the wire if the rate at which it's increasing its x position is always increasing at 2 centimeters per second. It's got to go pretty fast after a while, doesn't it? Right? Because to get over those two, it's got to go up a long ways after a while. Right? So you kind of get a qualitative idea about what this is going to look like. Here. Okay? So here's our picture. Okay, snapshot value, step one. Well, there's one. Right? They're telling us that x dot equals... Okay, well, I'm glad we were able to introduce this one today that we'll get to, you know, later. How's that sound? Okay, so the assignments, I'll put one of them. One of them's up. It's only got three problems on the first one. You know, these are not, like, just simple. you got to go through a process, so I don't assign very many for each assignment. But, I mean, really, I think for the most part, everybody's pretty caught up. Try to, try to really stay on top of this and spend a little bit of time on this every day. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Thank, thank you.